November is Hip Hop History Month. After celebrating Hip Hop's 50th anniversary this year, we have created our new hip hop collection to showcase the history and culture of hip hop with pictures, videos, conversations, and more. Visit digitalarchives.queenslibrary.org to explore QPL's hip hop collection and be sure to visit queenslibrary.org to check out our hip hop programs in November. Queens Public Library is proud to participate in this year's New York Cares Coat Drive. This citywide initiative aims to collect over 100,000 coats and distribute them to New Yorkers who need them the most this winter. You can donate new and gently used winter coats for children and adults at 14 QPL locations from November 1st through December 31st during our regular hours of service. Visit queenslibrary.org to learn more. Let's have some Thanksgiving fun at the library. Join us in the days leading up to the holiday for arts and crafts, concerts, movies, and more. Visit the QPL calendar at queenslibrary.org to see all our virtual and in-person Thanksgiving programs. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Alexander Stella, author of The Sullivanians, Sex, Psychotherapy, and the Wildlife of an American Commune. The New York Times states, astounding, Stella gives us a keen bird's eye view. The Sullivanians is a fascinating study. The New Yorker declares, juicy and fascinating. The Washington Post writes, wonderful, Stella's meticulous reconstruction of the personal history of those whose lives were profoundly shaped by the group has a thumping, almost thriller-like question propelling its plot. The Sullivanians is perfectly emblematic of the strange magic of Stella's narrative style. Vanity Fair raves, a disturbing, gripping, deep dive. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, The Gay and Lesbian Review, and have recently co-adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Mary A. Media in 2011. It is currently streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, was released in April by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its 10th year at the Queen's Public Library, is, Queen, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Alexander Stilla is the author of Benevolence and Betrayal, Five Italian Jewish Families Under Fascism, Excellent Cadavers, The Mafia and the Death of the First Italian Republic, The Future of the Past, The Sack of Rome, How a Beautiful European Country with a Fabled History and a Storied Culture was Taken Over by a Man Named Silvio Berlusconi, and The Force of Things, A Marriage and War and Peace. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books and the New York Times. Stella is the San Paolo Professor of International Journalism at Columbia University and lives in New York. Thank you so much for joining us, Alexander. Thank you for having me. It's, my, it's our pleasure. Um, please tell us a little bit about the Sullivanians for the viewers who don't know who they were and what they did. Sure. Um, who were they? <laughs> well, so this was a community of people that grew out of a psychoanalytic institute called the Sullivan Institute. And it was uh, founded by a couple of renegade psychotherapists who broke off from a more traditional um, psychoanalytic institute known as the White Institute that had been founded by a man named Harry Stack Sullivan, who was a very well-known, respected um, neo-Freudian psychotherapist. And so these guys had worked in that 
um, other institute, the White Institute, and decided it was too sort of stodgy. And they felt that the ideas of Sullivan could be carried further. And what they meant by that, what they took from Harry Stack Sullivan was the idea that human beings um, grew from contact with other people, unlike Sigmund Freud, who focused a lot on the first few years of his patients' lives, their Oedipus complex, their internal um, you know, conflicts between ego and id and so on. Mm -hmm. Sullivan believed that people continued to grow into adulthood and, and grew through their contact with other people. So they said, well, if that's true, then the family by definition is limiting, is suffocating. If you need contact with other people and multiple people to grow, then the family is, is going to limit your contact with others. Monogamous marriage is by definition limiting and um, suffocating. So they began to advise their patients to have lots of sex with lots of people, mm -hmm. uh, develop friendships and other kinds of relationships with many different people. And during the 1960s, they began to advise their uh, patients to live with each other in large group apartments on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. In the 60s and 70s in New York, as many of your um, you know, readers, viewers know, lost a lot of population. New York was being depopulated, lost like a million, mm. uh, a million people. Manhattan lost half a million people. And so you had these big pre-war apartment buildings that were half empty and the apartments were going for very cheap. And people who were students and young people starting out in life could rent them for very little money and you could you know, knock down the wall between two apartments and you had an instant commune. You had 10 people yeah. living together. So, they, and they wanted the women to live with women and the men with men so that they didn't form traditional family units. Um, so that was that was the initial impulse and, and how it how it came about. And there, so you mentioned the two psychoanalysts who, who sort of took the, the Institute into this new, onto this new level. They were Jane Pierce and Saul Newton. When and when and why and how did they sort of get together and meet and decide to do this incredible, incredibly ambitious thing? Yeah, so Saul Newton was a communist labor organizer originally um, in Chicago. He actually grew up in um, New Brunswick, Canada. His name originally was Cohen, he changed his name. And he was, um, uh, he also fought in the Spanish Civil War in 1937, 1938. Uh, which gave him a lot of kind of credibility with people on the left. Um, and he actually had no training as a psychotherapist. He did do some of the coursework for a degree in social work, but he was working in the bursar's office um, in for the White Institute. Um, and Jane Pierce, on the other hand, was a woman from Texas uh, who had an MD from the University of Chicago and went to do her training in psychoanalysis at the White Institute with Harry Stack Sullivan and other very famous psychotherapists who were practicing there. Um, and so by this point, um, Saul Newton was on his third wife and decided to make Jane Pierce his fourth wife. Um, I think he I think he saw that psychoanalysis was a really interesting uh, profession. He was not going to be able to practice it um, at the White Institute because he had no training formally. And um, that if he and, uh, and Jane Pierce decided to go on their own and form their own institute, he could suddenly become a psychotherapist. Because mm -hmm. one of the, the strange things um, that I learned in the course of um, working on this is that um, even though many psychoanalytic institutes have very strict um, you know, rules about who can be a therapist, the truth is you or I could hang out a shingle as mm -hmm. a psychotherapist with no training. And if someone was willing to pay us to um, listen to their problems, you're a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And so you can't be reimbursed by an insurance company um, but without a license, but an unlicensed person can be a psychotherapist. So Saul Newton, was able to kind of leapfrog from being uh, somebody, you know, cutting checks in the bursar's office of the White Institute into suddenly being the director of his own institute called the Sullivan Institute. And his wife, Jane Pierce, who was a very respected kind of um, psycho psychoanalyst on the rise at the White Institute, had the credentials and the credibility to attract patients and to attract other young therapists who came to train there. Uh, several people 
came over from the White Institute to the Sullivan Institute during those early years. How did you, when and how did you first learn about the Sullivanians? So um, I learned in about the, the mid 2010s or so in a very serendipitous random way, having dinner with some friends who knew an older couple that uh, had an unusual past. They'd become quite good friends with these people. And these people invited them to their Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they realized that all the people around the table had the same interesting past. They'd all been in this group. And um, so as they were telling me about it, I thought this is so interesting. You had what was essentially a kind of, at least in its initial aspiration, a utopian community that was basically hidden in plain sight 10 or 15 blocks from where I lived. I've lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan for many years. And um, uh, to think that there were, uh, you know, 40 apartments between, you know, 80th Street and 100th wow. Street that lived in this very singular way, uh, according to very strict precepts um, that were sort of diametrically opposite the way most people live. Um, and that they managed to keep it secret for most of this, uh, most of this time. The group went from the late 50s into the early 90s. Right. Um, you know, I live at 109th Street and um, they had a building at 100, at 100th Street in Broadway and a woman actually kidnapped her own child on the street in front of that building at 100th Street yeah. because the therapists had denied her access to her own daughter for six months and she mm -hmm desperate and uh, took desperate means so that all that was happening just down the street from where I lived and that I knew nothing about it intrigued me enormously and I thought I've got to sort of find out about it and see whether people who've been involved in this I can track them down if they're willing to talk to me and it is very intriguing and we're going to talk about the dissolution of the group in the 90s a little bit later but one of the things that really struck me about your account was how some of the principles of the Sullivanians are now largely accepted and even fashionable. Were they kind of ahead of their time in, in certain respects? Well, you know, in, in fairness, um, you know, as one of my characters and principal sources said to me, we asked all the right questions and got all the right answers. Mm -hmm. So what he meant by that is that, you know, they were, um, you know, of course, families can be complicating and limiting. Um, people are often scarred by the things they experience uh, in their early lives. Um, that, um, you know, it is true that, uh, you know, society gives us sort of stereotypical roles that we're supposed to um, follow and that those are often limiting and suffocating, um, that those roles were not designed for our personal happiness, but in order to, you know, keep society going. Um, uh, roles of mother and father and, you know, uh, parent and child are, um, <clears throat> you know, were created uh, for social reasons and not for our personal happiness. And one of the things, you know, I think it's significant that this group gets going in 1957, which is the year that um, the application for the birth control pill was um, mm. submitted to the uh, Federal Drug Administration. Um, and um, it ends in the early 90s when the AIDS crisis is raging. And so there's this period of, you know, roughly 30 years when it looked as if you could, you could sort of, you could separate biology from, you know, the, uh, from sex. You could have guiltless sex and sex without harm. Hmm. And so their view was we've organized society um, so that we can guarantee um, the paternity of a man's child, so he knows that his children are his children, those children inherit his property, and, and, you know, generation goes after generation. As a result, we've developed a kind of possessive ethos about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sexual jealousy and women being controlled by men so that they don't stray and sleep with somebody else and produce somebody else's child. And we've created a whole society around this that's basically... Um, the result of the limitations of our biology. And the pill suddenly, um, you, know, uh, you know, they felt like now we have the possibility of rewriting the script. And what if we began to develop uh, rules or 
ways of living that were about, um, you know, our own personal fulfillment and making ourselves happy. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that, so those were, you know, um, perfectly good ideas. I think also another thing they felt was that our modern capitalist society kept us kind of isolated from one another, alienated from one another, each person in their own little family unit or their own apartment, separated from others. And wouldn't it be good to have more community and more fellowship in our lives? And so they created uh, possibilities for that. Um, mm. And those things were, you know, interesting and potentially valid. And as you mentioned, um, you know, a lot of people are in today's world experimenting with alternative families, with sure. uh, polyamory, things mm -hmm. like that. The problem with this group is that it became highly prescriptive and mm -hmm. therapy became extremely directive. And so um, if you were, um, you know, dating somebody and you really liked this one person and you wanted to spend your time with that person, your therapy would say, your therapist would say, no, 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 you're getting into a focus. Um, you need to see other people. What do you mean you won't go out with this person or that person who asked to date you. Um, so the therapist was really intervening. They broke up relationships. The other thing they did, which was, you know, really, really damaging and painful, the people that got into therapy um, who already had children were instructed to send their kids away to boarding school. And in mm -hmm. some cases, they did so when the kids were very, very young. I interviewed a man who sent his two sons, age five and three, away to boarding school. And you can imagine the kind of place that would take children of that age and this sure. and those kids sure. got really messed up. It's traumatizing, um, yeah. Yeah. So that and yeah, anyway, so the so all these things, the way in which the therapy became much too prescriptive, um, I think, and and people realized with time they'd given a they've given up so much power to their therapist that that became really uh, da damaging. You know, you, you give each case so much attention and provide such great biographical detail. How did you go about finding former Sullivanians and, and how did they feel discussing their time in the group? Well, that was just a great voyage of discovery for me. I mean, I love, one of the reasons why I love being a journalist is that I love, you know, finding things out and, um, you know, opening up new worlds. And initially it was very difficult to find people and then to find people who would talk with me. Um, but once I kind of got inside of that world, it got easier and one person led to another. And um, once I think people understood, as I began to learn more, um, the people I interviewed had more confidence in me as an interlocutor because I understood a lot of the history and I knew the kinds of things that they'd gone through. And many of them were actually enormously happy you know, a lot of these people, when they got out of this group in the late, in the late 80s or early 90s, put this chapter of their life beside them. In many cases, they didn't even tell their children. Mm. If their children were, were young or not yet born when they left the group. They hid this part of their life from the people in their life or didn't talk with it about with their friends because they felt their friends wouldn't understand. So to have somebody to talk to um, about this um, who was not part of it, but knew quite a lot about it, was I think quite welcome to a lot of the people mm -hmm. I spoke to. And they really enjoyed, you know, initially they might've been cautious, but then the floodgates really open and, you know, not to be kind of facetious about it, but if people have spent 15 years in therapy and in a sex club, they will tell you anything. <laughs> I mean, it's, they, um, they're really, really open. And also, one of the things that was um, such a kind of nice discovery in working on this is the people that were in this group, far from being kind of brain dead zombies, were like really smart, far yeah. interesting people. Yeah. And so they were people I was genuinely um, glad to get to know and glad to spend time with. And going on a kind of voyage of mutual discovery with them was super interesting because after a while, because they had sort of like, not been talking about this and thinking about it for a while, they themselves began to open up and new things would occur to them in the course of multiple interviews. And we'd have a lot of interesting back and forth. And that meant for me that one, I could get to know them quite well. And as a writer, it meant that I could describe their inner life 
in a way that I've not always found easy to do in my work as a journalist, that what I really wanted to do was open up the subjective world of these people so that a reader would understand why what somebody at a first glance wouldn't make sense to them would make sense and why it made sense to them at the time. And I'm really glad that you mentioned how sort of highly educated and intellectual a lot of these uh, former members are. Um, you know, cults generally tend to attract people who are seeking a sense of belonging or family, people who are lost or lonely. The Sullivanians attracted many people who had families and who left them. Mm -hmm. um, what was the pull for them and what set the Sullivanians apart from other cults? I think we can use the word cult, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> it works. certainly yeah. became that. I don't think it was intended to be that at the beginning, but it, it definitely took on those um, characteristics with time. Um, I think the attraction initially was um, freedom. Um, yeah. Freedom as well as belonging, these things that you wouldn't necessarily put together. Uh, <clears throat> but for example, um, the novelist Richard Price, uh, who was in the group for several years and whom I interviewed, um, you know, he was just a year out of college, uh, living back at living at with his parents in in co-op city in the Bronx, mm. uh, going to graduate school, trying to get started as a writer, um, lonely, not so happy. Uh, one of his teachers, who was also in this group, a writer named Richard Elman, said, "You should see a therapist." The therapist said, "Why are you staying at home arguing with your parents? That's like a total waste of time. Get out, mm. you know, get out of there." Uh, and then, you know, in the therapist's office, there would be notices for uh, writers groups, uh, art, you know, uh, art classes, uh, dance groups, um, men's groups, women's groups, pottery classes. Um, people did things together. Um, they had parties every Friday and Saturday night and the Sullivanians parties were famous and really fun. You know, lots of, you know, 20 something kids getting together on a Friday and Saturday evening, um, you know, cheap booze and a, you know, garbage can. Mm -hmm. And um, and moreover, your therapist had more or less told you you had to go home with somebody. Um, mm -hmm. So he went to this party as a shy, uptight 22 year old. Um, and suddenly, you know, Richard Price is there and here are all these young people who are living together. Women are coming and going. A woman comes up to him and says, hey, do you have a date tonight? So, and he looks at his wife, she's like 11 o'clock. He said, what is it, a date? Isn't a date when you arrange to go to movies with somebody? And instead, this woman wants to go home with him mm. uh, or take him home. And he thinks, my God, you know, this is just fantastic. And on top of it, the men are also really nice to me. They want to get together and have dinner. Everybody is being friendly with each other. Um, so you've got community. You have sexual freedom. Um, you can have sex without guilt. Uh, you sleep with this one person, and that person doesn't get too upset or um, uptight if you sleep with her roommate or somebody else mm -hmm. the next week. That's the way things were done here, and you were being told by your therapist that if you were got jealous or angry about that, you were you know on the wrong road. Yeah, so, it's a great sense of openness and communalism. Yeah, I mean, it's so, very attractive. So particularly for people in their 20s, I think that was very liberatory and very exciting. You had women who got into this who, let's say, were um, uh, wives and mothers initially who were felt trapped in their lives. And their therapist was saying, hey, didn't you always want to get a PhD in anthropology and mm -hmm. you know do something different with your life instead of changing diapers? Send your kid away to boarding school and do that thing you've been talking about doing. So for a lot of people initially, I think that was very exciting and liberating. The problem is I think as time went on, um, you, you realize you'd given up freedom. Women who, mm -hmm. let's say, started in their 20s in the group um, in the early 1970s by the 1980s are in their mid to upper 30s. And they're tired of dating four people every week. And they may have some guy they're really into or woman they're really into. And uh, the therapist is interfering with their lives. They might want to have children. They realize... Um, you know, they started, they're taking children away from their parents and maybe that isn't the way I want to, you know, I really want to have my child and be with my child. So the whole thing then kind of changed. It also got more cult-like with the passage of time and those more controlling aspects became more obvious. You mentioned um, Richard Price. Who were some other famous uh, members? I know Jackson Pollock, right? 
Yeah, so um, in, um, in 1955, even before the group had formally uh, become an institute, Jackson Pollock became a patient of one of the, the lead therapists of the group. Um, the, the, the art critic Clement Greenberg, who was sort of like the Pope of abstract expressionism in the 1950s and 1960s, was a patient and a firm believer. And he got all of the, pa the painters and artists that he championed into therapy. Uh, people mm. like Kenneth Noland, Jill Zalitsky, uh, Larry Poons, the dancer Lucinda Childs, who's famous for uh, Einstein on the Beach, mm -hmm. um, uh, Richard Price, and we mentioned uh, the rock group Shalana. Two of the mm -hmm. members were in it. Uh, the guy who did the famous guitar solo in um, for Steely Dan mm -hmm. uh, was in the group. A guy named Elliot Randall. So it attracted a lot of people like that, which then served as a lure to other people. Uh, the singer Judy, the the singer songwriter Judy Collins was in, in therapy for like fifteen right. years. Wow. Um, so you know, I interviewed one person who you know ran into Judy Collins in her therapist's office, and they became friends. And all of that sort of validated that the presence of these very smart, creative people validated it in the eyes of other people who were getting into the therapy. Like these guys must really know something. Yeah. While these creative people are in therapy. You mentioned in your book that members of the Sullivanians seem to walk on eggshells for fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. What was the power that the leadership held over the members? Where did the control come from and, and why were the members so scared? Well, one of the things is that <clears throat> along with your, you know, therapy begins with a process known as transference where, mm -hmm. you know, a person who goes, to th goes into therapy is presumably in a moment of crisis or distress in their life and they go into a therapist's office and they begin to pour their heart out and they begin to feel better. Um, mm -hmm. And as they're speaking, some of that anxiety and distress, you know, kind of melts out of, out of them. And they realize, wow, this person is incredible. This person is actually, I didn't think somebody could make me feel better, but I'm feeling mm -hmm. better. So you suddenly attribute incredible powers to this person who has uh, relieved your suffering. So that's one building block. And, a responsible therapist um, engages in something called countertransference, mm -hmm. where you say to somebody, no, it's really not me. I'm not a miracle worker. This is just the way the process works. Sullivanian therapists would say, yeah, I really am a miracle worker. I mean, brilliant. And you cannot survive without this therapy. You would end up on the street as a drug addict in a mental hospital in prison, a suicide, if you were to get out of this therapy. Mm. But also maybe more importantly, these people weren't just offering a kind of therapy, they were offering a whole life. So you started out with a therapist, or in some cases, people took an ad out, you know, they followed a, a roommate wanted ad and ended up in a, in a group apartment with several people who were in therapy. And then they, there was pressure on them to go into therapy, everybody in the apartment would then be in therapy. So at this point, your social life had begun to revolve around the therapy. Everyone you knew was in this therapy. So the idea that you would be cut off from your therapy meant that you were losing all your friends and your community. Mm -hmm. And then a number of the people in the group's work life began to be connected to their life in the therapy. Um, you know, a number of the people were recruited as training therapists. So their income, their housing, their friendship, their community, and their therapy were all um, dependent on the leaders of the group. So the idea of, you know, you had people who had been in this group for five years, 10 years, 15 years, who hadn't spoken to their parents in 15 years, had cut off their old friends. So suddenly the idea of being out on the street, um, which is what would happen if you were seen as really defying the rules of the group or criticizing the leadership, the idea that you could just be out from one day to the next, and that happened to some people, and it was very destabilizing for them. Um, that was a powerful leverage to have. Um, security. Yeah, yeah, security. You know, you foment a kind of interdependency or codependency. Yeah, where you it's literally effective. could imagine yeah. your life outside of this group. And moreover, yeah. many of these people have become your good friends. It's not mm -hmm. just insecurity, but these are the people that you care about, the people. You want to be around them. Yeah, right. it's your family. So, um, 
Alexander, would you please read us a short excerpt from the Sullivanians? Sure. Um, I, I picked a couple passages precisely to kind of describe that moment of uh, transference. And um, so I'll start there. Okay. Michael Bray entered therapy in early 1973. Bray grew up in a fairly strict Catholic household in Western Iowa. After a year of college in Nebraska, he moved to Chicago and entered a seminary with the idea of becoming a priest. He liked the communal life of the seminary, but realized he didn't believe in God or in the Catholic church and wasn't cut out for celibacy. He had witnessed the violence of the 1968 Democratic Convention and sympathized with the anti-war protesters who were beaten by the police. He glimpsed the emerging counterculture, but he was 23. He was a 23-year-old virgin with a degree from the Aquinas Institute of Philosophy. He married a young woman at a Catholic college and he decided to become a psychologist. The one graduate school that accepted Bray was Fordham University in New York City. So he and his wife drove with all their belongings and found an apartment in the Bronx where the university was located. Bray began his graduate work and also had a job at the Veterans Administration Hospital, but he soon began to feel his life was seriously adrift. He and his wife had never been in a relationship, had never had sex, and didn't really know how to do either. Undoing the inhibitions developed preparing for a life of celibacy was not easy. By 19, 1972, they were two years into their marriage and still couldn't quite figure out how, how to make it work. Bray found himself spending time in the middle of the day, drinking alone, watching game shows on TV. He needed to do some therapy for a psychology degree and a colleague suggested he see his own therapist, Art Liebeskin. When Bray showed up for his first appointment, he found himself in the office of a man in his late thirties who was very short, not much over five feet and had a ponytail. The coffee tail at his office was missing a leg and was propped up by a stack of National Geographics. Well, this is different, Bray thought. But as soon as Art, the therapist, asked him why he was there, Bray burst into tears and began weeping uncontrollably, then managed to get out the words, because I'm afraid to be alive. And that, Bray said, nearly 50 years after the fact, started my part of the journey. I was basically saying, help me save my life. Hmm. I spilled out everything I could possibly think of. Anything that he asked of me or suggested, I was ready to try. Um, the second is a short passage at the moment when pretty much all patients, virtually all patients, ended up breaking off ties completely with their family. And this describes that moment in the therapy of a woman named Carol. Hmm. After several months, Pierce began to make clear that for Carol to really flourish and grow, she would need to sever ties with her family. In her frequent sessions, her past life and family were discussed in an almost uniformly negative way. Then one day, Pierce convinced Carol to write and helps her draft a letter to her parents, making it clear that she wanted no more contact with them ever. Carol showed the letter to Pierce, who watched her put it in an envelope and place a stamp on it and sent her out to mail it right then and there. She could see the mailbox from her window and watched me as I put the letter in the mailbox. I remember looking up at her and we waved to each other. Having committed what seemed like an irrevocable act, cutting her family off forever, Carol felt dizzy with anguish and an overwhelming sense of solitude. When she went to her next session, Pierce asked her how she felt. And I said, I feel utterly alone. I feel deserted. She said, well, you deserted them. I said, I know, but I feel utterly alone, and I did. Although it may have not have been planned as such, Pierce had just carried out a brilliant, if devastating, two-step therapeutic judo move on her young patient. She pushed Carol to break her ties with her family and then essentially blamed her for deserting them. It added guilt and self-doubt to the searing pain of loss, leaving her doubly vulnerable and needy for the solace from the one parental figure left in her life, her therapist. This would not have worked had Pierce not also established herself as a genuinely helpful, empathic parental figure, someone who in fact went beyond the bounds of the usual therapist, helping her with his schoolwork, hosting her at home, and taking a special interest in her life. So those are those two passages. Great, really powerful. Thank you, Alexander. Um, you referenced uh, Richard Offshe, the sociologist, and mm -hmm. his crowded bus metaphor when you're describing the cults or other high demand groups. Mm -hmm. Please explain this metaphor and how the Sullivanians began employing this approach in 1977 with the formation of what they called the Fourth Wall, their theater company. Also, was this the moment that the group became totalitarian? Yeah, so um, 
this metaphor of um, the crowded bus is um, is an interesting one and one I found uh, quite compelling. And the idea is that if you're um, you know on a crowded bus and the bus suddenly swerves and uh, jolts you to one side, um, most people are going to grab onto a safety rail and grip hard. And if you don't, you fall you fall down or fall off the bus. And so in moments in a group like this that um, has cult-like tendencies, um, the group will often go through moments that basically shake loose the people who are less committed mm -hmm. and make the people who are more committed, more committed. Yeah. And so, um, and, and this is very consistent with, um, you know, a lot of really uh, well-established you know, social psychology, cognitive dissonance theory, and so forth. Um, and so what happened um, at many points along the way is the group would begin gradually demanding more of the people in the group. And those would serve as tests, essentially, um, in which the committed would prove that they were committed and the uncommitted would um, fall away. And I can give you some examples. One was uh, the thing you mentioned, which is a very important turning point in the history of this group. Um, because there were a lot of really creative people in the group, um, people formed rock bands, they formed uh, comedy groups, um, they were you know, doing painting classes together and so on. Uh, Lucinda Childs had a dance class that she, where she taught dance to a number of people. And so several of them started uh, putting on skits and plays together. Richard Price himself wrote um, a skit for one of these performances. And at first it began in a very kind of informal way among friends. And they, but, they, but they were, you know, talented people. So they performed, they rented a theater. They all used to spend um, summers out in Amagansett in the Hamptons. The therapists all had houses out there and the patients would crowd out, you know, crowd together in summer shares and, you know, in some cases, you know, fitting 20 people into a house that was maybe designed with, you know, three or four bedrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd all hang out together and have fun. And so they would, during the summer, put on these plays together. And, um, and then they kind of got more serious about it. And they rented the Providence Playhouse down in the in Greenwich Village in New York, which is the playhouse that Eugene O'Neill had produced some of his most famous plays at. Um, and uh, they were kind of getting serious about it. And um, one of the therapists who'd had some experience in the theater was helping them do this and thought that this should be, you know, like a serious thing and gave it the name the fourth wall. The fourth wall in the theater is the kind of invisible mm -hmm. wall that separates the, um, the actors from the audience. Right. Um, and um, so as this began to grow in importance in the life of the group, and at this point there were probably th there were probably three or four hundred people that were part of this community, some more so and some less so. It wasn't there wasn't a formal membership. You know, you had people in therapy, you had people living in group apartments that weren't in therapy. It was it was looser, and uh, but. I think the leadership of the group saw that this theater company was really popular and that more than a hundred people were involved in one way or another in, in putting on these plays, whether taking tickets, doing lighting, excuse me. We live in New York city with uh, motorcycles, <laughs> <That's fine>. um, <laughs> uh, rooming by. So, um, so the leadership saw all this activity and thought, you know, maybe we should be controlling this. This is now starting to constitute like a rival community within the community. We can't have that. So one of the um, lead therapists who was Saul Newton's fifth wife after he dumped Jane Pierce, uh, a woman named Joan Harvey, who had been a kind of, you know, actress in B-movies uh, and a soap opera starlet when she was young before she became a psychotherapist. Um, she thought, I'm going to be the director of this. And so they basically forced out the woman who was the uh, director of the fourth wall. Joan Harvey took it over and Saul Newton, who knew nothing about the theater, was like the artistic consultant. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, it's a significant moment because this 
all this activity, this artistic creative activity in the group that was, you know, genuine and, and sort of bubbling up from the bottom was then suddenly turned into a top down um, organization in which the leadership uh, was calling the shots and controlling things. Uh, and so they merged together the theater group with the, mu the music group and everybody. Basically, if you were in Sullivanian therapy, you were expected to be part of the fourth wall. At that point, they had a formal membership because um, along with starting this theater, they decided to buy a property up in the Catskills that was a former um, you know, motel, hotel. Mm -hmm. They sold their properties in the Hamptons, the houses that the therapists had. They bought this property in the Catskills that could house about 250 people. And then everybody in the group was expected to chip in and pay an assessment to help buy this property. They then acquired a theater on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, the Truck and Warehouse Theater on East 4th Street, which they actually seized violently from the people who were the tenants who were in the group. Right. That was another moment of, you know, a swerve of the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so to go back to that metaphor, because I think it is important because there, there are these kind of stages of control. So first you have to decide if you're going to be in the fourth wall. Some people decide they didn't want to. And like, that's more commitment than I feel like. I don't want to pay up, you know, money, you know, every month in dues and, you know, buy a theater, you know, a place in the Catskills. I like going on my own in the summer. Um, so that excluded probably, you know, a hundred people. Um, who decided not to join the fourth wall. And then, as I mentioned, they did this kind of uh, violent takeover of the theater in which um, there was a, a, a theater company that was putting on a play there that whose lease had, um, you know, the, the owner of the theater didn't want to renew their lease, but they didn't want to leave. And so the fourth wall people, rather than litigate this, literally stormed in at closing time one night, hmm. physically threw out the people that were doing the old production and everybody from the group occupied the theater and slept there for the better part of a week, figuring the police is, are never going to arrest us all, which they didn't. <laughs> and so they, uh, they took control of this theater. So that was a kind of thing where if you're a, you know, there are certain people that wouldn't want to, you know, participate in something like that but the great majority of people did, but that was a kind of proof of commitment that would separate the weak from the strong, the committed from the uncommitted. Another really big moment like that, which is very, another kind of milestone in the life of this group was the nuclear accident in Three Mile Island. I was just gonna ask about that, yeah, 1979, right? And yeah. how did that change things in the group? Well, so what happened was in March of 1979, there's an accident at the, at the nuclear plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, known as Three Mile Island. And um, the, the level of radiation coming out of the plant is pretty limited. And the government is saying, you know, there's no reason to evacuate Pennsylvania, let alone New York City. But the leaders of the group who are kind of, you know, communist uh, people who've learned to distrust the government, say, I think they're lying to us. We need to get out of New York. There's like a nuclear cloud heading our way. We got to get out of here. We have women in the group who are pregnant. Their, fe you know, their fetuses could be endangered by this radioaction. So 250 people pick up, and many of them are working people. These are all working professionals. These are not you know, people living on an ashram somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. These are working professionals who uh, live in Sullivanian apartments but go to jobs during the day. Everybody leaves New York and, and settles in a motel in Orlando, Florida for a week or 10 days. And that was another kind of moment of proof where there were some people that decided not to go down to Orlando and like, this is crazy. I don't see people dropping dead in Pennsylvania or New York. Mm -hmm. uh, but the great majority went and that was another uh, moment. And then after the Three Mile Island thing, they began to impose a series of other rules, like um, uh, people had to people in the group had to listen to two news radio, twenty four news, twenty four hour news radio stations um, every night. So maybe there was news about a leak at a nuclear reactor somewhere, 
and if we weren't listening all the time, so group members had to sign up for time slots where, you know, you would be listening between nine and 12 and I'd have to listen between 12 and three and so-and-so would be, you know, covering the three to six slot. And so this became another burden that was imposed. Then uh, they started producing anti-nuclear uh, documentary films and putting on plays at the um, Truck and Warehouse Theater and they became convinced after the shooting of John Lennon, that their own leadership was at risk, that someone mm -hmm. would try and assassinate them. So then they had to have a security detail and communication systems. And, um, you know, because the threat of nuclear uh, disaster was there, um, they needed to have buses to take people out of, you know, so all they invented all these new duties for people to perform, and it became much more onerous for everyone. But amid all of this, there's this sense of um, paranoia, right? Because a lot of the, the the culture became such that members began spying and reporting on each other. Yeah, I mean that the that was always sort of like if you if you you were supposed since since all these people are in therapy, if your roommate was doing something strange or against the rules of the group, you would a almost automatically um, report it to your therapist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having a conflict with, you know, so and so. And, uh, you know, and the therapist may even ask questions about what's happening in your apartment. And so the therapy is supposed to be a confidential relationship and it was not in this group. And so um, uh, stuff was being filtered up from group apartments into um, therapy sessions and, and then fed up to the leadership. So, um, you know, if, if this actually happened, you were suddenly, you were beginning to have doubts about the group and feeling unhappy. And you shared this in the middle of the night to your bed companion. That person then went into therapy the next day and they're nervous that they've heard something that they shouldn't hear. And they tell their therapist and within an hour, the person who uh, you know, shared his doubts with his lover gets a phone call from the leadership saying, mm. What's this I hear about your not liking X, Y, or Z? So as one of my sources said, you know, we had a better surveillance system than the Stasi. We knew huh. not what people did, but what people thought. Wow. Terrifying so, and really fascinating. Yeah. So it was, yeah, really interesting um, as a, using therapy as a form of social control yeah. Was, yeah. to an extraordinary degree. There was also, um, in your book, you write about uh, accusations of, of uh, abuse, including child sexual abuse. Can you speak a little bit about them? Yeah, well, because the boundaries between therapist and patient were very porous, to put it mildly, mm -hmm. um, some of the therapists really abused that position. Saul Newton more than anyone, but also Joan Harvey, uh, who slept with her own patients mm -hmm. in many cases. And Saul Harvey, I mean, Saul Newton, would routinely ask his female patients um, to perform oral sex on him. Mm -hmm. And also the women therapists whom he supervised in therapy. And uh, so without really even seeking that out, I would be interviewing people and women would tell me that they were forced into this. And it was very painful and a shameful thing uh, for them to experience. Um, so that happened a lot. Um, what was the process for having children while in the Sullivanians? It was difficult to discern at a certain point, of course, the father because of the polyamorous or polygamous nature of the relationships. Um, and then also there were people who were dissuaded from having children due to their rank in the group. Yeah, I mean, in general, initially, they didn't want people to have children at all. I interviewed a woman who had seven abortions during mm -hmm. her years in the group and was never able to have her own children. She eventually adopted after leaving the group. Um, so those people were told, you're not ready, you're not mature enough, only the really evolved people like us therapists can have children. So the leadership was all Newton had 10 children, um, at least legally. Um, and uh, Joan Harvey through adoption and um, her own biological children had 10 children. So they were like the really evolved, mature people who could actually live with their spouses and live with their children. Um, the poor patients were not evolved enough. After a while, they gave the green light to a number of female therapists who were sufficiently evolved to have their own kids. Mm -hmm. But what they began doing was um, 
they would encourage women who were going to have children to have sex with numerous men during their ovulation period so you wouldn't know who the dad was. Again, they wanted to, to you know, sort of scramble the traditional family. So if you don't know who the dad is, nobody's going to be too possessive about this little kid running around who is, in fact, being mostly looked after by babysitters hmm. because they don't want the mother to be in too involved either. Then they did some things that got increasingly funky during the 1970s where they actually took children away from their biological mothers and reassigned them to other people. Um, wow. And um, I interviewed a number of those people as well, um, which for the kids was very confusing and, um, and often quite painful. Uh, of course. They wouldn't know in some cases who either their biological mother or father were because Gosh. they were taken away at very young ages. Um, there have been very little media exposure uh, about the Sullivanians, except for a New York Magazine article, which was published in 1975. But by the mm -hmm. late 80s, television programs began airing a series of exposés. Um, please talk about how the press impacted the group. Do you think that they were largely responsible for the, the dissolution? The break it was the certainly a factor. When um, this very courageous woman, Maris Papo, decided, as I mentioned earlier, to kidnap her own child, um, you know, she was 41 years old, finally gets to have a child. She actually had it with one man, um, her husband, Chris, who's a medical doctor. Um, but then three months into having a child, her therapist says, you gotta stop breastfeeding. You're suffocating your child, you're too possessive. She's forced to stop breastfeeding. And then one day the child is literally removed from her room where the child's crib is is handed over to a babysitter. Um, the father is technically now the only parent and she is not allowed to see her child. As you can imagine, she was in incredibly distraught. As time went by, she began to realize, I may never see my child again. She then consulted a lawyer um, who said, you have a right to your child. And so if you seize the child off the street, that's how you're gonna get your child back. And if it's you doing the seizing, it's not kidnapping. And so she hires two bodyguards who immobilize the babysitter when she brings the child out for a morning walk in a stroller. And she grabs the child and they jump into a car and go into hiding. The same lawyer, uh, who interestingly was the lawyer who represented the Rosenbergs um, in their um, trial in the 1950s, um, said, you need to talk to the press because this group is, cannot survive in the light of publicity. And so they set up um, a set of interviews with Joe Connison at the Village Voice. And the Village Voice does a big cover story on this called Escape from Utopia. At that point, all the kind of local TV stations, um, you know, and tabloid press start doing stories about it. And um, that makes things very difficult for the group. The group is already this business of this woman um, uh, seizing her child has already split the group in many ways. There's a lawsuit mm -hmm. that comes out of it. The lawsuit receives publicity. The group is beginning to splinter. Saul Newton by now is increasingly old and not well. And um, as more people defect from the group, paying the mortgage on the building they own at 100th Street uh, becomes more difficult. You know, the whole thing begins to kind of fall apart. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to be taking questions for Alexander shortly, so please start sending them in. I have a few more of my own. Mm -hmm. um, how are the children of the Sullivanians doing now, years later? How are the surviving former Sullivanians themselves doing? And many of them still abide by the philosophy of the group. Is that right? Uh, I'm, I would say a small minority. Some? Okay. Um, the um, a small minority. The kids are mostly doing okay. There are a lot of you know bright, creative. Uh, you know, kids um, that came out of this. Although as one of my sources said to me, you know, keep in mind that you've interviewed me and Sam and Eddie and these other people who are doing pretty well in their life. But there are a lot of people, the ones that wouldn't talk to you, um, who, who are really a mess. Mm -hmm. And so keep in mind that the people that are willing to speak about their experiences are the ones who maybe have their life most together. And there were people who were really shattered by mm. uh, you know, their early experience. But the people I spoke to were, you know, 
they bore scars, but they were, you know, had made good lives for themselves. And the same was true of any of the, the former members, but who, you know, many of them felt like Rip Van Winkle, where they'd been in a cave for 20 years, and suddenly you know, they came out of the cave and they discovered their mother was dead. Um, their little brother, who was 14 when they'd entered, was now like married with two children. You know, all these things, their parents had been in their prime when they went into the group and they were now old. It was, you know, very disconcerting and, mm -hmm. and weird to have that experience. So a well, first question is, or it's a statement and then a question. Thank you for the fascinating book talk on the Sullivanians, Mr. Stilla. Would you like to make a statement on the current rash of book bans in school and public libraries in the USA right now? As a historian and journalist, can you offer an explanation on this? Well, um, you know, as someone who's a writer, I'm, I'm not going to be a fan of, <laughs> of book bans. Um, you know, the... Um, you know, if, if a book is in the library, people are free to take out the books that uh, they want and ignore the books that offend them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I think uh, there are moments in our history when it becomes convenient to make political issues out of things like this because, you know, you quote a, an inflammatory passage from a book that offends you, you get people excited and upset in a community um, that doesn't share the values of that particular author, which may be one of 20,000 books in a library, and you can make an issue out of it. And that's, yeah. you know, you're just scoring, you know, political points, essentially. Good assessment. Culture Connection recently did a talk with Mike Rinder on his book, A Billion Years, and how he escaped from the cult of Scientology. Could you do a quick compare of Scientology and the Sullivanians? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, they, all these groups, have certain elements in common. They often have, you know, like the charismatic leader in the case of Scientology, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ron Hubbard, uh, Ron Hubbard and uh, Saul Newton in the case of this. Um, the There's always a very strong us versus them mm -hmm. in all of these groups. So in Scientology, um, I forget what they call the people they decide are sort of like, you know, negative negative forces, disruptors, who have to be, um, you know, excluded from your life. The same kind of ostracism happened if you were seen as being critical of the group. Uh, when you left, you know, uh, what's true of all these groups in both cases, once you left the group, you were completely ostracized and shunned. No one would have any further contact with you. Um, so all those things are, you know, Scientology, um, you know, I think is, um, you know, has had more staying power. And, uh, but I've always thought that it was essentially very much like the mafia, that it's really a criminal enterprise, that mm. get their hooks into you and they get their money out of you and it's a money-making machine and a power yes. machine. Um, sure. This group, I think, did have, um, you know, genuinely idealistic um, intentions, at least at the beginning, and then turned into something else as one of my sources said to me, you know, I got involved in something that I thought was a movement that then turned into a business and then became a racket. Mm. And so there was that kind of transformation. Um, you know, L. Ron Hubbard was, I think, really, you know, both kind of brilliant and crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he was probably really psychotic in some ways. Um, I think that's fair, yeah. And um, uh, whereas these therapists were just highly narcissistic. <laughs> Um, is psychoanalysis still relevant? What are a few of the best books on this subject? You know, that's really um, a good question. <clears throat> um, you know, I think that anybody that practices <clears throat> psychoanalysis now is what you would call eclectic in mm -hmm. that they borrow from many traditions. I think that few people believe that, you know, Freud you know, sort of wrote the gospel and that everything in that gospel are, you know, true. Um, Freud had some powerful ideas that have remained in people's thinking, but uh, the idea of, you know, Freudian analysis three or four days a week with the kinds of um, strict rules that it had during, you know, Freud's heyday <clears throat> is increasingly uh, marginal in the field. And so, um, you know, I think there are variations of what is sort of more generally known as talk therapy in which people 
talk about their lives in a variety of ways, um, you know, still has some validity, but also, um, you know, therapists who are worth their, thought, their salt are also open to other approaches, you know, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, um, the use of, of psycho, you know, pharmacology uh, to help people, you know, deal with their pain. Um, so I think, um, you know, eclecticism is kind of more the norm. I mean, ironically, you know, like during the pandemic, I think probably therapy has been enjoying a boom, but it's not mm -hmm. traditional, you know, Freudian psychoanalysis. It's more integrative and eclectic, right? Yeah, um, I, I have great book recommendations. I'll think about that and pass them along. Okay, good. Thank you. And then finally, thank you for sharing this book. I am going to read it. And right. the book... Yeah. The book is The Sullivanians, uh, Sex, Psychotherapy, and the Wildlife of an American Commune by Alexander Stilla. Alexander, thank you so much for this hour. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank everybody, for, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Yes, thank you, and have a great weekend. Okay.